Evening, everybody, or morning, or afternoon, or good uh, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to our 15th Open Clock Club. And um, tonight, as always, we've got masses packed in and uh, in part responding to some of the great questions we've had during the week through our Facebook page uh, and in part uh, progressing what we started last week or even the week before, which was refacing pallets. So we'll get round to that later on. Before we get there, we've got quite a lot to get through. So um, the first thing, as always, is welcome, particularly uh, new starters, um, people who have come here through our book, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, Volume 1. You can see we've got our Enfield uh, here waiting for a bit of a pivot straightening demo, which there is a video on anyway, but I thought I'd do it live. Um, so yeah, a few questions on Facebook this week. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, as always, this, I'll just... Yeah, I'm recording. This event has been recorded and it'll go on our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks archive, Open Clock Club archive. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your video turned off. But this event, uh, again, is really dependent on the live chat. Great to see some new faces there. Welcome to Open Clock Club. So the live chat, Keep that going, please. Uh, we've got Team Open Clock Club here who will be doing best to answer your questions and feed them to me. And if there's anything significant we don't get through in the session, then we'll either carry it over to next week or try and cover it on Facebook. So the first thing is we've had uh, a few comments, um, people trying to find different parts of our little kind of portfolio of activities that we're involved with now. So very quickly, and sorry if this sounds like a kind of promotional exercise, but I'm just going to run through those things. Uh, so let's just go here, share that. And so hopefully you can see uh, this screen. So we've got um, a website, which is a kind of uh, straightforward website, which relates to our book primarily. You can find a little bit about us on there and a little bit of promo for our book. So that's How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. I'm not sure it's that um, SEO friendly quite yet. So you might have to type the whole thing in to start with, but it's there and it's .co.uk, whatever they call that thing at the end. Uh, the next thing is our Facebook page, which is, as you can see, how to repair pendulum clocks. Just move that out of the way, I can see what I'm doing. And um, we've got 107 members now. I, I missed the point where we had 100 members, so uh, we were going to celebrate that. And it's been really cool. It's about repairing clocks, of course. So we sometimes get other stuff which we have to kind of fend off a little bit and there are loads of uh, Facebook sites as you probably know to uh, about buying and selling and collecting and all those other subjects anyway so we try to stick to repairing clocks and between us I think we're offering a pretty good service there um, it's it's busy I, I really like it and we're super friendly and um, try and keep an open mind so if you haven't already Please, uh, it's a private group, but if you just um, apply, I think it's one click and we'll let you in there. And then we've got three, no fewer than three YouTube accounts now. So we've got this one where you can find um, all the archive footage from the past 14 or 15 now Open Clock Clubs. There they are. We've got um, our first website, which is kind of the how-to videos which I haven't added anything to for a fortnight it's been a busy old um, couple of weeks but I've got at least sort of six videos all part way through so they'll be coming online in the next couple of weeks or month or something and then we've got the newest one which we started on Thursday night which is our live stream and big thank you to those people who joined us there it was two and a half hours long so it was a bit of a marathon and we uh, started looking at an early 19th century English long case clock. And we were basically talking about documentation and things and kind of the approach to working on historic objects. So please check out those channels. And as they say, like and subscribe, we'd really appreciate that because that 
uh, keeps us going. Okay, let's go back to our camera. Um, share, share screen. Should pop up in a minute. There we go. Good. So, um, great. So uh, this week, we're just going to have a quick recap on what happened last week. Let's just move that to one side for a second. And you may remember that we were using a, a device we'd made out of polymorph for work holding uh, in straightening this can and pinion. Now, this, I've put this clock back together. I haven't done anything about cleaning it yet. So apologies, uh, apologies for that. But I just wanted to show you that it had kind of been successful. It needs a little bit more um, adjustment yet, not quite uh, striking exactly on time. But for those of you that weren't here, the Canon pinion on this clock, we were looking at setting up the striking on a French clock, and we noticed that the Canon pinion was twisted. So we used this product called Polymorph, and we did a bit of, uh, made it like a little spanner out of brass to straighten it. And if we look now, um, we can see it's striking, it was striking late before uh, by about two minutes, was it? And now it's striking about 15 seconds, you see that too early. So uh, a little bit more, there we are, you can see that. So it's about 20, 15, 20 seconds too early. So I will just take it apart again, not now, and adjust that a little bit more. But it's kind of quite interesting because um, I think when you're making those adjustments, I would always say I timed um, that clock striking 10 and it takes about uh, 20 seconds or something to strike 10, um, the whole thing. So what's really nice, I think, is if the clock, if you've got a choice of it striking after or before, then maybe it wants to strike a handful of seconds before. So by the time the owner kind of hears it and looks up, the clock is bang on the hour. So if that's kind of a choice, maybe it should go exactly on the hour, but um, uh, that would be my choice rather than it already passed. And I think that's really important for things like, uh, it's quite nice when you have that sort of New Year's Eve event and everybody stood round and the clock starts striking. If it's already gone past the hour, then it's a little bit of an anticlimax. So from last week, uh, we have quite a lot going on. I've got my list here. Uh, Rob asked, could polymorph be used as a boxwood chuck? Uh, what a boxwood chuck is, if you imagine you want to hold some work, a bit like we did last week, say you're holding a barrel and you want to bore out the barrel concentrically to rebush or something, you can't really hold that in a three-jar chuck effectively because it's not going to be concentric and or the chance of it being concentric is quite low. And also you've got that problem of the jaws maybe damaging the teeth and things. So typically what you do is you get a piece of material like boxwood, which is what, why it's called the boxwood chuck, and you bore that out in the chuck, and then you fit the barrel into that. And uh, Rob said, could you use polymorph as a boxwood chuck? Be a really great experiment. The only thing I would say is you're gonna have to really keep the temperature down because of its melting point, or I think maybe call it glass transition temperature. So definitely worth, um, an experiment there. We have, as I said last week, used it for really kind of difficult work holding in the lathe. It's absolutely brilliant for that. So useful little uh, product. Um, then we've got a couple of questions about escapement setting up again, which we'll deal with it. We've kind of covered it once, but we've got two people, one of whom is a new member in our Facebook group and somebody who's been asking for a couple of weeks and I always forget to cover the subject. So the question, two questions, one is, if the pallet arbor and the escape arbor are too far apart, as in there's lots of drop, does that affect the duration of the clock? So just let's uh, have a little recap here. We've got our, um, you might remember this little jig thing. And um, so American clocks, one way up and other clocks the other way up, but it's the same thing. So I've set it. Uh, so when the escapement's working, so we can see at, I know we've been through this, but it's worth going through it again. Um, here, this is the active tooth. There's only ever one active tooth. 
So this active tooth is pushing the, this pallet, the exit pallet, and it's rotating the pallet frame around its axis in a kind of uh, clockwise direction as we see it. So what happens when that tooth gets to the end of the pallet nib like that, we can now see this gap here, which is our drop. Now, as we said before, you must have drop. Zero drop doesn't work. But as you increase the amount of drop, then you will decrease the efficiency of the escapement because you've got all the train and the escape wheel and the spring, everything's accelerating then stopping, more noise, more losses, and not moving, not transferring that energy to the escapement. So if we really kind of abuse this little jig we've made and open the centre distance right up, you can see, actually, at this point, look, the escape wheel is nearly spinning round. I mean, obviously, you're going to look at that and you're going to think there's something drastically wrong here. So let's just back that off a little bit. Right, so it's actually kind of working now, but with lots of drop. Again, let's just get it back on that exit pallet. And we can see the gap there between the uh, entry pallet and the next active tooth is quite big. So the answer to this is, firstly, adjusting the escapement isn't like hit and miss. There is um, a kind of process to it, which we describe in our book. And I'm going to go through again uh, in a few minutes. The problem with this is it's not that it will stop the clock per se, but you may remember a few weeks ago, we talked about escaping arc and supplementary arc. And again, uh, we've got a few new people here. So I'm just going to quickly go over it again to answer that question that I've forgotten about for a couple of weeks. Um, so let's get my paper, which is... So yeah, Rob, a little bit less twist on the um, uh, cannon pinion. So I'll take it off, put it back in the jig and move it back uh, a little bit. So again, we're kind of going over a little bit of old ground here, but let's just uh, quickly take our pendulum, which normally let's call that the, uh, the line of centers or the point of rest, move it up a bit. Um, and then when you, if you were to start the pendulum swinging, but not giving it a big push, just start it with a tiny little bit of impulse and slowly, slowly, slowly build up amplitude to the point where the clock is just escaping, uh, we would call that escaping arc. Oh, we'll have a different color. I know we all like a bit of uh, color coding. A bit of blue. So blue is the absolute minimum arc the clock will run at. Now, if the clock was running at that arc the whole time, it would be no good because any deviation in uh, energy uh, getting to the pendulum or a bit of a puff of wind on the pendulum or something, and the thing's going to stop. It's got no kind of safety margin. So the, the clock has to be overdriven. It has to be driven over the escaping arc. So you can test this, as uh, said on Facebook a few times, if you put a bit of pe uh, paper behind the pendulum of a clock you've just repaired and you uh, start it ticking and just get it so it's just running escaping arc, then let it settle down for an hour and then see what the difference is, that value there is called supplementary arc. Now, I think to answer the question about the adjustment of the escapement, the point is that that supplementary arc is critical. You can't have, have no supplementary arc. But if your escapement is adjusted with masses of drop, like this one is at the moment, then that supplementary arc is going to decrease and decrease and decrease. So I think that's the answer to the question about the escape wheel and the pallet arbor being too far apart. It's that what's happening is supplementary arc is decreasing. And if it's a weight driven pendulum clock, like a long case clock, then maybe it's suffering from Thursday syndrome where the weight and the pendulum get to be the same effective length and you get sympathetic resonance, which robs more energy out of the system and the thing stops. 
The other um, part of this question is about adjusting the escapement. And the answer basically is that you get your, um, I won't show it in the clock just yet because we've got that pivot straightening exercise. So you um, put your clock together. If like this, your clock has got an adjustable back cock, then life is quite easy relatively. If like, we'll see it later on when we start looking at pallets again, if like a, the a European 18th century or 19th century clock, the back cock is steady pinned, you've got no way of adjusting that center distance. So life isn't quite so easy. With these screws here, these screws underneath have got elongated holes. So you can actually change the center distance. That is the distance between the escape wheel uh, hole here, and the pallet arbor pivot hole here. You can bring those two closer or further together. So when you first put your clock together, um, this is answering our Facebook question, the escapement will be in one of three states. It'll either be jammed, it'll either be working, or it'll either be like I just showed then where the wheel is spinning round. Now, broadly, if the wheel is spinning round, state three, then the center distance is too great and you have to bring them together. If the escapement is jammed, uh, maybe uh, state one, they're too close together and you have to open them up a bit. If they're in state two, the thing is already ticking, the chances are that you still need to reduce the center distance. And I'll show you how we do that. As I said, all this is beautifully described and illustrated um, in our lovely book. So uh, here's our clock. I'm going to put the, I'll take my gloves off because they're a bit awkward for this. Um, I'm going to put this, I hope, escapement in. But before I do that, I thought, oh, what I really want to do is to be able to uh, push the escape wheel around from the third wheel. Now, um, with no names, no pack drill or whatever the expression is, but this wheel, in our book, we called it the upper intermediate wheel. And John and I uh, discussed this for like hours and hours and hours. Remember that book's for beginners. Um, in horology, this wheel, the wheel that's between the center wheel and the uh, escape wheel is called the third wheel, irrespective of whether it's the third wheel in the train. In this clock, there's an in, a lower intermediate wheel between the barrel and the center wheel. So this is actually the fourth wheel in the train. So we made an executive decision to call it the uh, upper intermediate wheel. And there you go. So let's straighten up this pivot very quickly. Uh, as I said, there's a video about this on our YouTube channel. And the way I'm going to do it is uh, I'm not, I could put this in the lathe and spin it, which would help. I'm just going to do it by hand. So I'm going to get a bit of uh, bushing wire because what I want to be able to do is to extend the pivot so we can get some kind of sensitivity on it. And I'm going to make that bushing wire fit over the end of the pivot. Now, um, this, this clock, the iron or the steel is, the steel is soft. So I don't think there's much chance of it breaking off. But if we're working on that French clock that we saw a minute ago where the steel is much harder, I'll get a pin vise for this, then there's a good chance that pivot will break off. So what we want to do to minimize that risk is to bring the pivot. We don't want to anneal it. So we don't want to get it red hot. But what we do want to do is to bring it up to blue, which it might be that um, softness anyways, so to temper it. Um, if you just start heating this, what will happen is the end of the pivot will get very hot and the bit where it's actually bent here um, won't get that hot, so it won't do any good. So I'm going to cover it with this bushing wire to start with to kind of make a little uh, heat sink on there. But before I do that, I've got to broach out the wire. So I'm just going to... Uh, Shouldn't take too long, he says. Just brought you out a little bit. Actually, it's probably quite 
tight. It is wires really hard and kind of sticky as well. It's really kind of great bearing material in terms of wear, but it's probably going to take a while to uh, brush it out so it fits nearly there. Oh, maybe you could use the other end. So um, we're going to heat up the pivot with a spirit lamp. Again, try not to use one of those sort of uh, blowtorch things um, because it'll just heat it up too quickly and you'll really anneal the pivot and completely soften it. If you were, if you were re-pivoting, if the pivot had broken off when you were going to drill out, then again, uh, blue should be enough. And if you're using tungsten carbide, it doesn't matter at all because that'll drill into pretty hard steel. Um, so let's just keep going here. So what we want here is just to be a nice fit. And this, as I said, is just a way of making that pivot uh, longer. And shouldn't spit on it really. I'll probably make it go rusty. Right, nearly there. Just try the other end. Right, okay. So I think the other end is the one I used in the video anyway. So we've brushed that out so it's a, a good fit on the pivot. And you can see what it's done is it's allowed us to manipulate the pivot. Uh, well, putting a, you could put a pair of pliers on it, but it's not really going to give you the, the sensitivity. So what I'm going to do is just um, heat it up. Hopefully, I'll just move my camera a little bit so it doesn't melt it. Be moderately inconvenient. I'm just going to heat it up with a spirit lamp. And what I'm going to watch for, because I don't want to, uh, oh, we had this problem last week, didn't we? It doesn't work that. It's only, you only want some gas. We've got a new tool for lighting the gas, by the way, which we're all very excited about. Um, a little bit less of a fire hazard, yeah. Now this is going to get pretty, pretty hot pretty soon. Pretty quickly. Uh, again, if there was um, a collet here that was soft soldered on, like last week, we'd have to um, make a heat sink. Uh, so this is just going to be hot to hold. And I probably should just protect the um, the arbor with a bit of damp cloth or something or heat gel. So what I'm looking for is the end of the arbor just to start to turn brown. We've got any more questions, Rich, while we're doing this? Um, Jeremy, Hot. Says, Jeremy says, can you explain, do you heat to blue and leave it or quench? Uh, it, it doesn't really matter, Jeremy. I would leave it. Um, uh, so if you heat and you've already tempered, quenching it isn't going to um, cause a problem. It's not going to re-harden it because the hardening process is... Uh, Let's just get this bushing wire in a collet so I can actually hold it. Um, the hardening process is um, quenching from that sort of orangey color, you know, really hot, and it's the speed of the quench. So if you're quenching from blue, it ain't gonna make any difference, uh, frankly, but for a piece of material that's this small, I would just do it um, and allow it to cool anyway. It takes, you know, a fraction of a second. Right, that's a bit better now, not quite as hot. The good thing about the spirit lamp, you see the pinion there? Just starting to change color. Now you might say, well, that's ruining the pinion, but of course, all it's doing is it's bringing it up to that blue temperature anyway. This is already quite soft. Should really be heating the wire a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Nearly there. Jeremy 
needs to bend a new clip spring to try and get it to fit how, how can she do that right so if you've bought a clip spring or a bit of blue steel and you want to bend it you can do two things obviously you can risk bending it as it is you could or one of three things in fact you could right there we are i think we're about up to temperature so let's just let that cool for a second um you could anneal the thing completely uh, so that's heating it up to orange and letting it cool very slowly uh, but that, then you can bend it and do what you want but then you've got to re-harden it and then you've got to blue it again and the problem with re-hardening it is it'll all go black and and pretty horrible and be covered in oxide so that's kind of a three-stage process so i would say um check that it's already tempered to blue uh, by doing this you can just clean off a bit of material with a bit of um abrasive paper or something so you've got a bit of white steel heat it very slowly with the um, spirit lamp and then when it's blue just allow it to cool and then you've got your kind of best chance of um of being able to bend it and it'll still be springy you know you haven't taken it so far that it's not going to be uh springy anymore right this is still quite warm as you may imagine Jeremy says what happens if the wheel is soldered if the wheel is soldered uh if there's a collet here like um uh, well like this like uh and there's a soft soldered collet then you've got to protect the soft solder from the heat uh, and as we said last week you would either use uh something like uh, can you cut a potato open and clamp that around it or cool gel as used by jewelers or a bit of cloth that's soaked in water but you need to protect the uh, soft solder from getting up to temperature otherwise you've got two problems so if you can see there now um but the pivot's kind of gone dark brown it hasn't quite got to blue i was a little bit impatient but um there you go so what we're going to hope is that that's now soft enough but not so soft that we have to re-harden it again we can just leave it like this and i'm going to Oh, well, there you go. Broke off. So that's our job for next week, which is repivoting this wheel. Um, we'll make a drill like our video and uh, we'll find the center and we will repivot the wheel. These open clock clubs just keep generating all this lovely work. Brilliant. Right. So we're on to repivoting next week, live on air. So there you go. That's the thing about bending the pivot when I did it on the video uh, straightening the pivot up it was fine um maybe I should have let it get to blue rather than stopping at brown but maybe it was just fractured and it fell off and that's it so the problem with straightening the pivot is that if that happens actually for a beginner again this is one of the reasons why we chose the Smiths Enfield because um the parts are kind of interchangeable and normally you know in historic work we wouldn't advocate um uh, taking parts off one thing and putting them on another but we felt that it was a reasonable adjustment for the beginner and in fact you could buy another old movement and get yourself out of the soup by taking another upper intermediate wheel or third wheel uh from uh the, the other clock and swapping it over However, in this case, it's provided us with a really great exercise for next week, and that is uh, drilling this out and fitting a new pivot and so on. So back to our, how we're doing for time, is it half past? Yeah, it is. Right, well, we'll maybe just, I'll just fit this up. Uh, which way around does it go? We've forgotten. Um, so that's going clockwise. So that's going that way. So it goes that way around like that. And then we'll have a couple of minutes break and we'll come back and we'll just finish uh, adjusting the escapement. Uh, sorry. Cool. Pop that on there. Excuse your fingers. Right, got our escape wheel in there. Interesting to see this hole has been um, bushed. So we can maybe look at that as well at some point. And that is going that way around. Mark says, 
um, why would you not use an existing small drill when refitting? Oh, it's the same. Uh, Mark Mark says, why would I not use an existing small drill when repivoting? You would, you could mark. I mean, the reality is that most people would use uh, probably tungsten carbide now, which of course has its um, has its problems, uh, but they're incredibly sharp and it gets around the problem of um, having to let the arbor down. So you probably would. The only reason I say that is because it's a great exercise. Um, you are, let's say it's Saturday night and you're fixing this clock and you've got to have it done by Monday morning. You can't get a drill today or tomorrow, um, even with next day delivery, maybe. And the reality is it's a useful exercise because it takes an amount of time. It takes about and a half an hour, let's say. And um, and you can just do it and it's very little cost and it's good fun and stuff like that. So it's all about just building skills. But the reality is. Yeah, you'd probably just go and buy one or use one from a set. OK, so we'll just spend a few more minutes adjusting the escapement. We'll come back. We'll have a little comfort break, though, and we will come back. It's going to be 32. So let's come back at 35. OK, and we'll finish up this. Then we'll talk a bit about abrasive stones, as promised.
Welcome back. Uh, a lifetime of learning. So very quickly, we put our escapement together, um, having broken the pivot off, <laughs> and it's in those one or three states. Locked, where the centre distance is too small. Uh, the escape wheel is free running, where the centre distance is massively too big. Or like this. Uh, let's just get it so you can see. It's better on the little model, but where there's very little engagement of the pallets and lots and lots and lots and lots of drop, which we know is bad because broadly um, we're going to lose energy. Now you can see here that this um, screw hole is elongated and it's elongated for a reason. And the reason is so we can move the um, uh, back cock up and down. So the way to deal with this is, now a lot of the American clocks have got, and I've forgotten what you give the name for it, but the verge or the pallets are on a movable arm, aren't they? It's exactly the same principle. You can change the center distance between the escape wheel and the pallets. So what we're gonna do here is um, move them closer and closer together, very fractionally by tiny amounts until the escapement just locks. So, oh, sorry again, you can see really well. See, we've got quite a lot of internal drop there. So we're just gonna move it fractionally closer together. And I'm gonna move it to the point that the clock doesn't work. Now we've actually got quite a lot of internal drop, no external drop. So maybe the pallets need a bit more adjustment. So I keep moving that fractionally closer together until that point. Okay, it's locked now. So the, we now know that the center distance between the scape arbor and the pallet arbor is nearly perfect, but it's just fractionally too close together. So we're just gonna move it a tiny bit further apart, just weeny weeny bit until it begins to tick. And that way we can get, there we are nearly, you can see it's just hanging up on the corner of a tooth. There we are. So it's just running through. Now you'll occasionally find that when the escapement's adjusted like this and it's only just running, you might think that's the perfect uh, state of adjustment and the clock's going to run its best. But actually what sometimes happens is it's so closely adjusted that the escape wheel tooth or the pallet catches on the back of the escape wheel tooth and you don't notice it. The clock still runs, um, but it's just, just, just touching. And um, that will actually obviously cause a problem. So we put the other screw in and we check again that things, right, you see, just putting that screw in, it's so closely adjusted, has mean that it jams slightly. It's still jamming on the outside of the... Uh, on the exit pallet there, which is great because we know that it's really close to being perfect. So I won't do it now, but we loosen that screw off again, move it a bit further apart until we've got that right. So there's the adjustment when the escapement uh, has got a variable kind of center distance. If it doesn't have an adjustable center distance, um, like our pallets that we hopefully will get around to sooner or later, um, then uh, you've got a bit more of a problem. Okay, <laughs> the next thing on our list is talking about stones. I think for a couple of weeks, people have said, tell us about the stones, Matthew, uh, abrasive stones, because I, um... all right, and we've got questions too. So let's have a question. I'll try and talk about stones and questions at the same time. Could you have cracked it due to the bending? Is that a worry? Yeah, I suppose so. If the pivot was, you can, when you're doing it like that with a piece of bushing wire or something, you can really feel, you know, you get that feeling when a bit of metal has work hardened and it's just about to break, then yeah, definitely it's worth giving it a bit of a wiggle to check that it isn't going to break in service. I've never known that happen unless you get a ratchet click fail or something in a weight drop and then it sometimes breaks the pivot off. But um, yeah, possibly uh, if you bend the pivot back, it could have broken. I've got a feeling, um, I'll have to look back at my video, but I think 
that was the one that I've already bent once for the video and I bent it back, but um, who knows? Yeah, it's always a risk. I wouldn't um, re-pivot though, unless I've got a feeling that it is actually weakened. You know, when you bend it back and it just doesn't feel right, then yeah, uh, re-pivot. Says with both holes being elongated, yeah, wouldn't you have to adjust both sides to keep it even, not on a cant? It doesn't really make. I mean, th that the back cock, uh, Daryl says, would you not make it even? Yeah, you would for the aesthetic, I suppose. And also, what it'll do there is that um, the what you want is the suspension spring here to be running. Uh, vertically don't you so yeah you would you would adjust it doesn't make much difference to the center distance how you do that but it certainly makes a difference to the uh the back cock slot here but actually sometimes it's riveted in here but you can maybe rotate that independently but yeah you want this although again within a couple of degrees it's probably not that um not that critical uh jonas says what's weenie weenie bit in millimeters uh, John has got an expression for what a weenie weenie bit in millimetres is, but regrettably it's not something that can be repeated on air. So there we go. So abrasive stones. Somewhere I've got my amazing uh, list that I've done. Oh, here we are. So world according to Reed, um, abrasive stones. Uh, and somebody asked for it and somebody asked again. So so here we go. Oh, it's a thing was right okay so um this whole subject uh i had a quick look into it during the week it's like 20 lifetimes of phd level research with a multinational industry behind you to get scratch the surface of it grinding is massive i kind of new because in the old days students would talk about uh, polishing and grinding and burnishing and those words kind of get squidged together um but it's absolutely uh massive so um let's just talk about these stones to start with this one as you know is my super favorite it's a 1000 grit ceramic whetstone it's broken a few times but i keep gluing it back together this is its finer uh, sibling, and this is the corner, coarser sibling. I don't hardly ever use these two, frankly. This one is my go-to abrasive for sharpening gravers, for sharpening scribers, for finishing in the days when I used to have a centre lathe, for finishing lathe tools when they've been on the offhand grinder. You use it with water. This particular one is made or oh, branded global, you know, that maker, Japanese maker of knives. So um, there's all sorts. Uh, when we look at our little box of stones here, we've got broadly, there are natural stones and there are synthetic or man-made uh, synthetic stones, if you like. And there are three things going on here. This is how I understand it anyway, as I said, world according to Reed. So polishing um, and grinding and lapping are all connected. They're basically all forms of grinding. So if you imagine you have whatever it is, the mineral that's gonna, uh, the crystal shape, that mineral is sharp and it's gonna cut material off whatever it is you're grinding. Now, if that, uh, mineral is really hard, like diamond, for instance, it's going to resist uh, being broken down into smaller um, pieces. So if you're using a diamond stone or something, then what you'll get, you'll get a finish that doesn't change as you grind. And that's really good. That's kind of what you want in grinding. Um, if you have a material like this, which is aluminium oxide, which is a bit softer than diamond, nine on the most scale of hardness as, a co as opposed to 10, then that material will uh, slowly break down as you use it on the surface. So you get smaller and smaller pieces and the corners get knocked off it. So you get more of a polishing effect. Now, for those of you that have ever used something like auto sole metal polish or T-cut or Brasso, those products are grinding products that are called polishing products, but they're specifically designed. So the particles, you know, when you start 
with metal polish, it kind of sounds a bit gritty. And then after a while, it gets finer and finer. Cause that's because the material in there, something like kaolin or china clay, is relatively soft and it's breaking down. So polishing and grinding are kind of the same thing. Um, it just depends on uh, the hardness of the material. We're all familiar with maybe with these things which are called uh, generically oil stones. You can use them. The oil is a kind of a wetting agent or lubricant when you use them. This one's had a lot of uh, uh, abuse here. And um, this is probably silicon carbide. So this is up there, I think, about the same hardness as, um, as our aluminium oxide here or our corundum stone. Very kind of uh, relatively inexpensive different hardnesses. Now that, in most of these stones, that um, grinding material, the aluminium oxide or the silicon carbide or whatever it is, is normally in a matrix. So like on these stones, I don't know whether you can see here, but they get worn away quite quickly. And now that is intentional by the manufacturer because they want to constantly re reveal a new layer of grinding material. Otherwise it would become a polishing process. Uh, the only one in the synthetics that I've got here that's different from that is this stone. And this is branded as degusit. Now this is also aluminium oxide. So it's, um, they put chrome in it to make it look ruby colored. Cause that's what a ruby is or a sapphire. Sapphire, I think, has got iron and titanium colouring. Uh, Ruby's got chrome in it, but that's the only kind of difference of both aluminium oxide. Um, but this is pure material. It doesn't have a binder or a matrix. Basically, they somehow get aluminium oxide powder and they squidge it together and then they bake it or sinter it and it fuses into this uh, material. So this is really good because it's hard. It's, it resists being grooved. But the problem with it is over time, that surface does get broken down. It doesn't reveal a new surface. So you have to refresh it with either a diamond stone or another stone of this uh, type. What else have we got here? We've got natural stone, which is Arkansas, which uh, somebody will beat me to it here. It's Orzac Novaculite, which is a kind of silicon quartz. So a lot of these stones, they're all basically called ceramics gen uh, generically, uh, or most of them are called ceramics generically. It's kind of stuff that you dig out of the ground. And it seems that every country has got its famous abrasive stone, whether it's Slovakia or Japan or America or Wales or Scotland. Um, we talked a few weeks ago about the uh, famous Tam O'Shanter horn stone which is a form of slate but again the same thing just softer I think it's silica still um, and uh, it's one of those stones that's a polishing type device because that surface is relatively soft and it breaks down so very very quick run through that thing if you want super hard grinding and you want a consistent surface then go for something like the degusit stone here which is synthetic ruby or diamond of course now diamond's great and it'll cut your hardened steel no problem but the, the problem with diamond is it doesn't break down so if you want to polish something for instance as in grind it finer and finer and finer effectively, then you've got to go through different grades of diamond and you have to keep those apart as well. So you have to clean everything between each kind of phase of grinding. Otherwise, the new phase gets contaminated with the, uh, with the old phase there. So um, incredibly quick, what else have we got here to root about in? Uh, this one, again, it's similar to the uh, Degusit stone, uh, aluminium oxide, but this is by the American company Spider Co, who do a lot of knife sharpening materials. These stones are great, but they're incredibly fine. So they're only really any good for sort of deburring de operations. Um, they're used in the glass industry and metal manufacturing industry. And I think that's kind of my take home for a very, very quick tour here. 
is that we clocks people, of course, are right down the bottom of the food chain. In a lot of these um, abrasives are developed for things like medicine and the nuclear industry, uh, Degusit in particular, making very high tech ceramics. We don't, of course, feature there because um, we uh, we don't have any money and we don't spend any money. The watch industry is a bit better because they've got money, a little bit of it. Um, but that's, I think, really exciting because what it means is that we can all go out and be quite experimental with new stuff, with new manufacturing techniques that we'd never get the chance to um deal with like spark erosion and wire erosion and 3D printing if it wasn't for those people at the top of the food chain who are developing all this stuff at the cost of billions of uh, dollars. So there we are, very, very quick uh, run through uh, grinding there. Just one more thing to say because we're going to run out of time and we haven't worked on our poor old pallet frame today is, I'll show you this and it's out the way because if you've been following us on Facebook or whatever, you'll know that I'm not a great fan of abrasive paper. Um, and the reason, let me just be clear about it. Um, new making is very, very different in my book from uh, working with historic objects. The, the kinds of clocks I typically have uh, lying about, yeah, the, um, some parts of them might have been polished when they were new, but they had kind of filed or scraped finishes, draw filed, that kind of thing. So there's very, very little use in my practice for abrasive paper, um, because one of, as I said before, one of the foundation stones of, um, of clock making um, is sharp angular detail, and it's ever so easy to lose that. Now, I do have abrasive papers. I had uh, 20 years ago, when I first started at college, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, I was told that you've got to get this new amazing product by 3M called uh, Lapping Film. So I went out and I keep these in separate folds, as you can see, to stop them from getting contaminated. I went out and I bought the whole range. Uh, I've, I had more money in those days of this 3M lapping film, which is aluminium oxide. So it's the same thing we've seen in the stones glued to a bit of polyester. And it's, I think, developed again for this optic fiber industry, something like that. It's really cool, but I've never used it. You know, I've literally had this stuff, well, I've used it a bit, obviously, but kicking around in these folders for 20 years. And the most useful thing, I've got all the grades, really went completely over the top on it. The most useful thing I've found it for is for things like polishing a hammer if you want to do some riveting or something like that. But rarely, may, yeah, every few months I'll use a bit. But if you're new to uh, clock making, then please don't be kind of bullied or pressured into saying, no, oh, you need this and you need that and you need the other. It's great to buy tools and equipment, but buy them as and when you need them, basically. So... Question about lubrication, lubrication. Yeah. Water or oil? Um, water or oil for the stones. I would always use water. Now, often, oil stones haven't got anything to do with oil. Uh, typically, they were used with thin oil, and I think uh, Norton, the manufacturer, I think Rachel's putting some links out there. Right? Yeah, she's put some links on the live chat. Uh, they make a very thin oil, which is like a paraffin type thing. I would just maybe use a bit of paraffin. But the problem with that is they all, the, the stones get soaked with oil and they're all yucky and uh, pretty horrible. So I would just use the ceramic stones and use them with water. I've got a little squirter here with a tiny bit of um, fairy liquid in. Uh, so it acts as a wetting agent because that's what you want it to do. You want it to break the, the surface tension between the thing that you're grinding and the, uh, the stone. So I just use a bit of water. It's much cleaner around the workshop. Uh, your hands don't get all yucky with oil and that kind of thing. Right, uh, of course, we're nearly out of time, but it's time to go back to our palettes. So we'll do a bit and then predictably we'll start next week. We won't start immediately with the repivoting. Anyway, it's gonna take me a while to get my head around there. Now, what I've done here, I've actually, because I needed to practice this a bit, I've soldered on a bit of hardened steel, 
Well, you may remember where we got to was this stage. So we took a bit of mainspring, clock mainspring, the blue steel stuff, and we heated it to bright red or orange, and we allowed it to cool slowly, which anneals it. Now, a lot of people uh, stick the spring on when it's blue. They don't anneal it and they don't reharden it again. And I think that's absolutely fine. I do this because I want to know that when it's on, it's dead uh, hard. Now, somewhere in the midst of the week, we were talking about, uh, oh, I was for a suspension spring. We were talking about um, uh, feeler gauge stock, which is half inch wide, hardened and tempered steel for um, feeler gauges, obviously, but we were, somebody was talking about making a suspension spring um, out of it. And I thought, well, that would be really cool for this project as well, if you had some of that stuff. You could, um, you could use it to reface pallets with. It would be good stuff. So anyway, here's our annealed um, suspension spring. Now you can see that it's far too wide for our pallets. So in the next few minutes, we're going to cut it down. But first, I'm just going to, you remember, I just broke it off, snapped it off. I'm just going to, it's annealed now, hammer it down. Sound effects. Because so, we've, uh, and again, that's where your 3M papers is good for. Where you've got a hammer like this and it gets marks on it, use that for polishing up the face of the hammer. Right. So, because this is annealed, we can get it reasonably flat. That. And now what I want to do is to bring it down to width uh, of the palette or a little bit over, because I'm eventually going to use either a stone or a diamond file to bring it to nearer size. Um, and I know that this is four millimeters wide. So I'm just going to put my um, marking blue on there, Sharpie pen. And I'm going to mark it. At, at four millimeters. Uh, never ever use your caliper for marking a bit of material. It's very, very bad practice. Um, there's a device called Jenny uh, Calipers or Odd Legs. If you can see, I've just got a little mark on there. Now to cut this, and this is kind of general uh, use and interest, you can get that on your piercing saw table uh, and you can try and hold it. And it's a bit of a faff to cut it. Or you could use a pair of uh, metal snips, arrow snips or whatever they're called. But I'm actually going to chisel it. Now this is a useful technique. So top tip time before we all go. I um, cabinet makers look away. I got a chisel, an old uh, typical wood chisel, but I ground it or I stoned it on my thousand grit uh, ceramic stone and put this, the normal bevel on, which is what, 20, 25 degrees. And I flipped it over and did that on the other side as well. So it's no good at all for uh, chiseling wood anymore. But what I'm gonna do very quickly before we have to say goodbye is get at least to the next step so we can, progress next week. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set this in the jaws of a vise. Can't actually see, of course, but um, that never stopped me before. Just clamp that down. Everyone loves a G-cramp. And one day, I hope that this technique will be of use. Wobbly camera moment. And I'm just going to find a hammer or a mallet or anything. Just cameras in the way. Chisel it off. There we are. So oh, that kind of made up for the pivot breaking off. Now I'm going to lose it on the floor.
There we go. So we've got our material down to size. It's quite neat there on the edge. I'll need to um, file it a little bit. And if I can find my latest new toy, very, very last thing today, thank you for bearing with us, is um, I can't remember how we got to talking about this, but um, I bought one of these jewelers ring clamps. Um, work holding is always a kind of major challenge. And I thought, ah, for this project, what would be really good would be a jeweler's ring clamp because I can hold the material nice and flat and you see how it works. It's just got a wedge in here that you tap in like that. We can hold it without hurting our fingers. And now because this material is annealed, I can just file the edge of it and file the burrs off. These things cost about seven pounds, I think. So 10 or 12 dollars or something, I don't know. Uh, and it's really useful and um, can't quite remember how we got to that. So there's our bit of steel, which is now annealed and it's about half a millimeter over width for our pallet face. So first thing next week, we're gonna shape it um, to the same shape as a pallet face and we're gonna solder it on with soft solder. Then we're gonna take it off, then we're gonna harden it and then we're gonna have a working escapement, he says. So there we are. Thank you for joining us. We'll leave the live chat open till five past seven. And uh, great to see you new names out there and keep the live chat going, keep the Facebook page going and we will see you same place, same time next week. Thank you very much.